I really want to ask that whether have you ever imagined that what would have been the fooding habits of our ancient Indian people? Whether they were having the tea with potato chips in the morning or fishes in the evening? Whether they were having the vegetarian food or non-vegetarian food? Whether they were using the raw food or the cooked food? Whether the art of cooking was developed? All these unearthed questions which are lying below the earth from past years has been researched by one of the students of Kalindi College, Ms. Janvi Sharma. Ms. Janvi, over to you and you can begin your, with your presentation. So good evening to one and all present here. I am Jahanvi Singh from Kalindi College, uh, but currently pursuing B honors, B honors in history from uh, th uh, third year. So everyone, uh, I will be starting. Everyone here sitting in this meeting needs certain things which they feel ca they cannot survive without. Some need money, some need good marks, some need a 24 seven touch with their phone. But in the end, all of us need food. <clears throat> Other things like water, home, sanitation, etc. also comes in the same category. But today, we will discuss only about food and not the current scenario of food, but the one which we hardly talk about. So as you can see on the screen, our topic for today's session will be food habits in ancient India. Before moving ahead, I will, uh, uh, with the talk, I would like to discuss my objectives, which I will try to achieve by the end of this talk. So firstly, I will discuss about the history of Indian food consumption. Secondly, uh, I'll, I'll be elaborating upon the various food practices that developed over the ancient ages. Then tracing the origin of vegetarianism, delineating the inseparable link between di dietary health practices and medicines, and establishing a sense of keen consideration towards the unquestionable virtues of traditional Indian food. And the sources I've used for uh, this whole talk are Feast and Fast by Colleen Taylor Sane, Indian Food, a Historical Companion by Katie Achaya, and A History of Ancient and Early Medieval India by Upender Singh. And this is the timeline period which I will be covering. And you can see it. Okay, so prehistory represents the longest part of human past and is associated with the emergence of anatomically modern humans and important developments in stone tools, technology and subsistence strategies. But when thinking about the earliest human beings belonging to, this pre, uh, belonging to the prehistoric era, we only imagine some hunter gathering societies or people of stone age, which is not completely wrong either because even the hearsay have some, com have some reality in it. But did our ancestors immediately started killing or hunting for their meal requirements or did they discover it slowly with numerous experimentations in the, is the question which can be answered while looking at the pace of evolution in their existence. I feel it would not be wrong to say that in our, if our ancestors never experimented during their lives, then probably today we would, be, uh, we would have never been able to sit like this and discuss about them. After hominid phase diverged into two categories and humans got separated from apes, is generally believed to be the time when meat entered the diet of humans, who fall in the category of homo, homo species. But fruits were considered to be present and consumed even before and after the divergence. One of the major source of prehistoric times are the stone tools discovered via the archeological methods. And as the tools were found, and as the tools found were showing advancement with respect to the time period they were found in, the Stone Age was divided into three phases, namely Paleolithic Age, Mesolithic Age, and Neolithic Age. Edward Latter suggested that the Paleolithic Age in India is further divided into, into three phases, such as Lower, Middle, and upper, upper Ages, largely on the basis of changes in fauna associated with the different types of tools. This, this, age is, uh, this age on a whole was attributed with the usage of pebble and core tools like hand axes, cleavers, and chopping tools. Later, a technique named Levelois, which included flake tools carved out from the core tool, were mostly traced from the Middle Paleolithic age. Blade tools, uh, blade tools made on flakes, for example, parallel sided blades and burins were believed to have been discovered by the Upper Paleolithic age. 
these tools have found have been found mostly in all parts of the subcontinent from potwar plateau and the sivaliks didwana in rajasthan khiran valley in gujarat the narmada valley belan valley in up cave sites in karnool in andhra pradesh delhi ridge near the main gate of university <laughs> of delhi uh, and uh, acheulean hand axes from the campus of jawahar lal nehru are also so are also are some sources of the paleolithic sites discovered from uh, <clears throat> are dis uh, so discovered so far and the latter two are comparatively from a bustling site for such a finding and clearly reflects the inadequate excavations hitherto g r sharma and j d clark has thrown light on the usage of stone tools for various subsistence activities of the paleolithic phase such as cutting slicing piercing and chopping which uh, which could have been associated with food processing hunting or even craft work faunal remains at the sites included those of bat nilgai antelope gazelle cheetal deer wild boar tiger horse fish baboon etc the mesolithic age is often described with the discoveries of microliths marked as the next step towards evolution perhaps affixed with the wooden handles microliths yielded scrapers spear heads knives scythe which of course enlarged the possibility of using vegetable foods and gave uh, food gathering a new dimension some of the important sites excavated related to this period are sarai nehar rai mahadaha damdama chopni mandav in belan valley lekhakia in mirzapur district of up bagor langhnaj and perhaps many more yet to be discovered another important source of prehistoric era was the paintings and engravings many <clears throat> many evidences are found from the bheem betka paintings which are dominated mostly by the animal scenes including the cheetal leopard tiger elephants panther antelope deer squirrel etc many kinds of birds fishes lizard frog crab scorpions were found too in mesolithic art at the bheem betka and elsewhere animals are represented either on their own or as a part of hunting scenes it appears as if hunters either hunted singly or in groups sometimes even accompanied by dogs paintings at bheem betka also reflect division of labor on the basis of gender men mostly men are mostly depicted as hunters and women are shown gathering and preparing food like grinding or kneading foods on food on cones but it is still difficult to identify the type of vegetable being processed but scenes of people collecting fruits and honey suggest their consumption the major transition from hunting gathering to food production based on the domestication of plants and animals is associated with the next cultural stage called the neolithic age also known as the stone age, new stone age uh dated nearly from 7000 till 2000 bce thousands of plant specimen are collected in the course of mehergarh excavations like charred grains and seeds barley was found in mehergarh and seems to have been the most important crop evidences of wheat and a new cereal called oats were identified bones and remains of domesticated animals like cattle cattle sheep goats are discovered too but a sudden increase of carbohydrate in diet of humans in neolithic age must have enhanced the notion the enhanced the notion of balanced diet and perhaps similar conditions may have appeared in the indian subcontinent too like how women in other parts of world faced a boost in their fertility levels with the inclusion of carbohydrates in their diet this stage is often referred to as an outcome of a long series of collective experiments including many generations of humans v gordon child coined a phrase called neolithic revolution suggesting some massive changes and developments in this period especially a shift in stone tools with the shift in subsistence strategies but the beginning of animal and plant domestication did not meant the end of the hunting gathering way uh, hunting gathering way of life rather one can say that maybe options and choices increased for humans during the neolithic age moving further to the uh, to another significant period of indian subcontinent was the establishment of harappan or indus valley civilization dated approximately from 
2600 till 1900 BCE Harappa is regarded as the first civilization of Indian subcontinent and requires our due uh, due importance and attention tracing the subsistence mediums of Harappan valley the trade it had between mesopotamian uh, mesopotamian civilization acts like a good source because the existence of harappa is provided via the harappan seals with script found in the mesopotamia not like the modern day tan uh, tandoor but a similar working item as sh uh, uh, shown on the screen uh, was <clears throat> found in harappa because uh, ha was found in harappa and it was probably used for making breads which was also commonly used in mesopotamian civilization this reflects some sort of food custom exchange between the two civilizations main crops were found uh, mostly barley and wheat evidences of barley being exported to uh, mesopotamia are also estimated residue of cooking vessels and human teeth found at farmana a site 60 60 kilometers away from delhi suggests that turmeric ginger and garlic were used as flavorings by the people of indus valley civilization talking about the sugar items sugar cane was not much known to the people of indus valley uh, main sweeteners were like honey dates palm sugar and even fruits like jujube jamun and mango were consumed as the form of sweet sea salt and rock salt were also available cooking oil was also used it and it was made from the mustard and sesame seeds or perhaps even from flax seeds pastoral nomads were common uh, were common in indus valley civilization they wandered with the herds of buffaloes which were an important source of milk goat and sheep are found and they must have been a good source of meat bones of wild pigs have been also found at many sites but it's estimated that they were probably not domesticated and uh, next as the coastal uh, location of harappa it suggest that uh, it suggest to a big extent that fish and seafood played an important role in the diet of harappan people even some symbols on harappan seals appeared like fishes so although we don't know much about the recipes followed by the harappan people but the archaeological ev evidences prove that they probably consumed good amount of protein and fiber in their diet moving forward uh, we arrive at the <coughs> age of rituals with the appearance of indo aryans in the second millennium bce commonly known as indo aryan or vedic age dated nearly from 1700 till 600 bce which marked the beginning of those unique features of indian society like caste system the veneration of cows and the central role of milk and dairy products in the food customs focusing on the latter two later two factors we can gain some ideas of the food habits and lifestyles via the extensive body of written text called the vedas these were orally these were orally transmitted for centuries but were fi uh, finally written about uh, 1200 bce one of the oldest uh, of these was the rigved which have humongous literary work devoted to the gods and also gives evidences of ritual practices and formalities required in the form of food ingredients for example yajmans were the patrons who paid the brahmins to perform yajnas which included uh, worships prayers offerings praises and sacrifices conducted at the home because vedic india had fewer temples fire was regarded as the purest of all the elements because agni the god of fire was considered the mouth through which gods eat the sacrifice there were three kind of yajnas cooked food was offered on the domestic hearth secondly public sacrifices and the soma ritual talking about the public sacrifices in simple terms it was kisi pashu ki bali bhagwan ko chadhana this involved the killing of animals and offering the meat to the gods which was later eaten by the patrons and their guests the meat was cooked in a cauldron or kadhai or baked in a chula or hearth the animal sacrificed included goats sheep oxen bulls horses and cows soma ritual on the other hand included the use of intoxicating or hallucinating substances especially for honoring the deity called indra rigveda contains hundreds of references to soma ritual but it is not clear what intoxicating sub sub substance was used 
a favorite food mentioned in many of uh, many hymns of rig ved was ghee or clarified butter it was considered as a divine substance after soma and ghee the most the most frequently mentioned item in rig ved is cow there are more than 700 references and three hymns on cow textual evidences also show that cows were occasionally sacrificed sacrificed in ceremonies honoring one's ancestors now commonly known as shrad sesame seed balls or pind was offered in the same ritual as well this practice can commonly seen in the contemporary times too but cows product like milk ghee and yogurt became part of the ritual uh, religious rituals since they were considered the pure foods by vedic people therefore cow was venerated as a cosmic symbol or the universal mother and source of life this is the reason that panch gavya that is combined five products of cow milk yogurt ghee urine and dung were seen as supreme purifying materials <clears throat> in vedic times disease diseases were associated with supernatural forces the physicians of vedic gods was dhanvantri who is even uh, who is some part uh, who in some parts of india is worshiped as god the atharva ved written around 1000 bce is a collection of incantations and spells against diseases demons wizards and noxious animals but it also contains a few recommendations of medical treatments for example black pepper is recommended as a treat as treatment for an arrow or any other wound alexander the great was so impressed by the ayurvedic practices which are believed to have been written in the atharva ved that he sent several indian physicians to greece where they may have influenced greek medicines talking about the ayurved it mentions that all matter is made of five elements that is earth water fire air and space and in humans these elements manifest themselves in the form of doshas or fault which flow within the body the doshas are vat the product of wind and space pit product of water fire and bile kaf product of earth and water earth earth and water works of great tri uh, works of great triads that is sushrut charak and uh, vagbhat are the main sources of ayurvedic period most uh, and mostly uh, and most of them have talked about the digestion which is extremely important in ayurved there are six basic taste or rasas that is a sweet sour salty bitter pungent and astringent according and according to ayurved a person's diet should contain all six uh, to maintain a balance and promote health for example <clears throat> bitter food reduces pith and kaf but increases increases vat for uh, sweet food increases kaf but reduces pith and vat meat is mentioned uh, meat is mentioned import as an important uh, ingredient in ayurvedic cures charak lists four animals that should be kept on the premises of an ayurvedic uh, hospital as shown on the screen a thin meat uh, a thin meat broth or shorba we, uh, was recommended for shortness of breath and cold moong dal has many benefits according to the ayurveda if it is consumed with right food mixtures it can balance doshas to to a good extent and ayurveda also promoted the idea of seasonal food consumption for better sync between health and environment i will end the uh, vedic period with uh, a statement by charak which goes as without proper diet medicines are of no use and with a proper diet medicines are unnecessary later coming to the 600 bce it is known as a turning point for some really accurate reasons as there were political entities of 16 mahajanpadas usage of iron formation of major sects like ajivika jainism and buddhism <clears throat> latter two shared similar features but jainism was still more severe and hardcore in practices it was like a renunciant uh, age of the earlier times due to the emergence of such sects the notion of karma and ahimsa emerged first in the collection of philosophical texts like upanishads and also known as vedanta the end of vedas the concept of food cycle is mentioned in upanishad and that food 
ईटर एंड ब्रह्मान आर दी सेम एंड कैन नॉट एग्जिस्ट विदाउट ईच अदर अहिंसा दैट इज प्रैक्टिसिंग नॉन वायलेंस गेंड मच मोर इंपॉर्टेंस इन दी जैनिज्म एंड बुद्धिज्म आइडियोलॉजीज एंड बोथ एडवोकेटेड वेजिटेरियनिज्म एंड दैट नो एनिमल शुड बी हर्ट और किल्ड सो दिस वॉज लाइक अ चैलेंज टू वेदिक सेक्रिफिशियल किलिंग्स but eventually one can also say that this was it was since this period that the concept of vegetarianism started appearing in indian subcontinent in the form of sympathy towards any living being and these new movements gained much import uh, much success also because of the fact that sacrifices in earlier ages required hundreds of animals to be donated by the farmers which put a great burden on them <clears throat> the mon the mauryan empire from 324 till 187 bce also faced a ban on the sacrifice of many animals under the uh, under the emperor ashoka as he became the follower of dhamma due to the impact of jainism and buddhism had on him reports of greek travelers like megasthenes indica buddhist and jaina texts and arthashastra by vishnu gupta provided some information about food consumed in this period megasthenes quoted saying that indians lived frugally never drank wine except as a part of sacrifices and ate mainly a mixture of rice and thick stew perhaps a form of dal or curry there were many varieties of rice found like black and red red rice odana a general porridge like dish was made from rice payodana a rice uh, was rice cooked with yogurt honey or ghee shrao dana made with sugar and khee, milk was like modern day kheer it is estimated that poor people ate kulmasha a thick porridge of grains or lentils cooked with little water and flavored with jaggery oil during the mauryan empire a dish called sikharini similar to modern day shrikhand payasa and rice mo, rice modak were consumed too there are also many sources which suggest that rice was consumed on daily basis <clears throat> as summarized by om prakash in his work economy and food in ancient india rice was a staple grain in uh, grain in no uh, northern and eastern india arthashastra talking about arthashastra uh, it has specified how much should be consumed by various categories of persons perhaps indicating some kind of rationing system in that period poaching was subject to heavy fines alcoholic drinks were made from rice barley grape palm mango wood apple sugar wood apple sugar cane jasmine or the bark of certain trees and it was sold only in small amounts lively pub scenes were also present in that era and there was a government monopoly on alcohol so it can be seen that rice intake increased in this period and vegetarianism as a concept gained popularity but there is no proof explaining any diminishing levels of nutrition consumed after the fall of mauryan empire in 18 uh, uh, 187 bc bce and india was politically fragmented for some time until the arrival of famously known golden age empire of indian subcontinent under the rule of gupta dynasty from 300 ce till 600 ce later there were also the emergence of text called dharma sutras dharma shastra and manu smriti which were believed to have been written by brahmin priest due to the threat caused to vedic culture and hinduism by the new sect like jainism and buddhism these texts were clearly viewed as an extension of the ritual prescriptions of vedas and their central purpose was to define dharma or perhaps these dharma literature works may have been motivated by a desire for stability and establishment of social norms caused by the period of political and social uncertainty that followed the disintegration of the mauryan empire mauryan and shunga empire says colin taylor singh how food of a person should be prepared for whom he could from whom he could accept food and with whom he could eat these questions are answered in dharma literature introduction of a practice called falahar in which a person observing a fast has to avoid eating certain culti- uh, has to avoid eating um, cultivated grains 
and this practice can even be seen practiced in the contemporary times <clears throat> onion and garlic were reputed to have an aphrodisiac property which is why they were forbidden to certain uh, communities especially like students and widows these texts also had rules about the consumption of an animal what is actual food contamination rules about leftover food and a very absurd concept of roti beti prevailed it means eating with someone from outside one's group could be the first step towards sleeping with them although not a major change in diet can appear immediately but for a basic idea about what people ate in the golden era of india india under the rule of gupta empire and many other regional empires can be traced from the chinese buddhist scholars fashian's work who wrote that people did not killed any living creature or even drank intoxicating drinks nor they consumed onion or garlic except that of chandals who were considered the outcast from southern india the secular work known as sangam literature of tamil poetry written down between 600 bce and 300 bce reflects some food items and their consumption like kerala was famous for black pepper farms a modern day poha rice dish was consumed other items mentioned were idli appam noodles made from rice flour aval flattened or beaten rice soaked in milk and bamboo coconut coconut and cloves were used to flavor meat and pickles and also mixed with bhang that is cannabis moving further and talking about the new religious movements from 300 till 600 ce it is often seen as a phase of brahmanical revival with the emergence and evolution of sects like vaishnavism shaivism and shaktas the main gods were vishnu shiva and shakta or the mother goddess but also emerged movements like tantrism which changed the meaning of food consumption to a great level for those who would follow it there was a close relationship between shiva and Sh uh, shiva and shakta cults as the dts shiv and shakti are closely closely related which can be traced from the statements like shiv without shakti is shav tantra promised the attainment of nirvana nirvana those who wanting to join a tantric sect were initiated by a guru in a secret ritual sometimes held uh, sometimes even held at a ceremonial ground which required partaking or consuming of the five m's <clears throat> madhya that is alcohol mamsa that is meat fish uh, matsa that is fish mudra that is parched or fired grain and methuna that is sex uh, sexual coupling according to mahanirvana tantra killing of animals should be avoided except for ritual purposes and only meat sanctified by tantric rituals can be eaten in mahanirvana tantra alcohol was called tara the mother goddess uh, herself in liquid form and mortals who drink wine with their mind under under control are immortals on earth and became like shiva himself tantra was open to all all caste including women it seemed like the most liberating yet difficult food and life practices offered by the tantra tantra sect so uh, i would say that up till now i have mentioned food practices and variations since the ancient ages which reflect that although diet must have been affected by the taste buds of humans but on a big scale it was also the other factors like religious practices notion of right and wrong trade cultural beliefs etc played a big role in human life while consuming food but unlike the present times when things like dalgona candy and coffee trends on top instant foods are easily accessible filled with preservatives food variations in earlier ages were far more well balanced and healthy fusions of food according to the ancient sources discussed so far and <clears throat> as we reach towards the end of this talk i can tell the motivation behind choosing this topic which lies in the fact that food is an integral part of human life and uh, statements like roti kapda or makan we are what we eat clearly suggest this and since food is not mentioned in abundance in our academic sources but maybe discussing it in a meeting like this can bring no harm 
so uh, we all can agree to some extent that globalization have ruined our food practices to some extent but seeking for solutions from past can help as common sayings like we learn from uh, our past mistakes appears contradictory in the respect to food but statement like old is gold can surely prove a little justice to past food practices and consumption thank you for listening to me thank you Uh, thank you uh, thank you ms jani uh, it was really an en- enriching and enlightening you know enlightening talk uh, but i can see there are a lot of questions of our audience like the budding listeners who are present there today so uh, but uh, dear listeners we have changed our format right uh, now you can directly you know interact with our speaker by raising your hand and by just directly asking a question by your own mouth right so i would like to invite avinash pande first to ask his question to janvi avinash if you are here then you can ask your question directly all right i think avinash is not in a state to ask uh, you know a direct question uh, basically he was asking a question like uh, do he is asking a question like did ancient indians eat non vegetarian food also like his question is directly this yes yeah. yes they did eat uh, non veg because i have mentioned so many uh, especially the ritual practiced by vedic uh, people it mm-hmm. had the practice of ritual that is bali chadhane ka to ritual tha to they did it meat and yes okay answer they is did. yes okay 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 uh, the next question will be from nikita nikita if you could ask your question by yourself it would be great uh, we would really like it uh, or otherwise i would have to spell it nikita are you listening hello? you can ask your question yes hello uh my question is what food was called food of the gods in ancient india was it include non veg or not and why all right uh, janvi uh-huh. see uh, in different different phases they consumed food uh, like especially in vedic period i have talked about the product of cow they consumed the uh, especially the cows product in vedic age were considered more divine like but i uh, so divine like is also somewhat similar to god's food and uh, but when we talk about the tantra or some later periods then they have talked about the consumption of uh, meat as a ritual then maybe right. we can say to some extent but not there were uh, okay. many in different phases there existed different foods which were devoted to god and maybe we can call them god's food also if you want yes. to speak so definitely definitely i agree with that and now the next question would be from shiva tiwari shiva if you are in a state to ask the question it would be great you can ask uh, it or i would have to you know uh, prepare it shiva okay am i audible yes yes you are <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Shiva, is, what do you think about offering the life of animal to god as we say bali as a religious it's good or there must be some changes see <clears throat> i feel changes have already been brought by the uh, introduction of sects like jainism and uh, buddhism so i guess changes have appeared but then it's all about what you believe i won't uh, comment on this because it's a religious or a very uh, subjective opinion but of course changes have appeared in the form of sects like jainism and buddhism uh, i would take just last question from archana varthi she is asking basically ki what are the impact of globalization like she is asking ki do you think that globalization has a negative impact rather than the positive aspect like impact on our uh, food culture i would say not completely negative also but then as i have mentioned the foods like dalgona candy and all such stuff i don't think that's good for us and uh, the uh, there is a huge uh, increase in consumption of carbohydrates especially with the coming of uh, things like pizza burger and all such stuff have increased our consumption of carbs to a very big extent so 
i would say that globalization has to a very on the larger side i would say that it has a negative impact in terms of food i would definitely. say yes Yes, 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 definitely. Thank you, Miss Janvi. It was really a great session with you, and uh, we really got uh, to uh, know a lot about you know the ancient Indian food and what these people used to eat. Thanks a lot once again, Janvi.